So uh, welcome to History of Optics. Today we are going to talk about the beginnings of optics and kind of the historical significance of them and, and uh, where they lead us today. And so we're going to uh, talk about lenses first because these were kind of the first inventions. Um, people sort of discovered lenses possibly through things like water drops and being able to see magnified images through water drops and then, you know, trying to make their own essentially of, of recreating those but on a larger scale to magnify things. Uh, the actual word lens comes from the Latin word lentil and down here in the bottom you can see a picture of lentils. Lentil is a type of bean and it's got that kind of um, converging lens shape to it on either side. And so uh, when people started making these lenses they said well they look like these beans and so it comes from that, that Latin word. Um, there are lenses as old as 2,700 years in um, in cultures in Assyria, and so when archaeologists go into these ancient sites, they dig up um, artifacts, and among those, we see lenses occurring about 3,000 years ago, uh, which is pretty impressive because lenses can do a lot of things. They can focus light to help you make fire. They can magnify images for you, um, and that's a pretty impressive technology. Um, there is also what we call Visby lenses that have been made out of quartz, and those are found as far back as the Vikings. Um, and so up here in the top you see this Visby lens made out of quartz. Um, sometimes we think maybe this was a thing for jewelry, uh, but possibly had a functionality as well, much like, much like uh, monks are known to have used lenses for reading, and they called them reading stones at the time. And so this was before the invention of glasses but starting to use lenses to our advantage in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. Um, people then thought, well, okay, we've got these reading stones. Well, what if we made them into a device that you can put on your eyes, right, instead of having to put down on a paper? And so the first spectacles were invented in the late 1200s is when we start to see these kind of showing up. Um, and they only corrected farsightedness, but nobody knew how that worked until the 1600s. So they were around for 400 years before anybody found out how lenses work exactly. Um, progress in this field led to the development of microscopes and telescopes. And so uh, around the 1600s, you start to see a really big interest in these, you know, these spectacles and kind of, well, how do these things work? And well, they make things bigger, but how much bigger could they make things? And, and people started playing with the science of lenses and uh, ray tracing and magnification at that point, which led to some pretty interesting discoveries. And so um, there's no true historical documentation of the first inventor of the telescope, right? Um, basically, this arose from all of these guys who made spectacles and then started just playing with lenses. Um, in 1590, we see the first telescope, but there's a lot of argument and debate about exactly who made that. Um, Galileo gets a lot of um, credit for that, but there was also Zacharias Janison and Hans Lippershey. Um, these two guys were actually spectacle makers and they were in the industry together. Uh, Galileo, of course, well-known scientist and, and kind of explorer, naturalist, um, recorder of the physical world. Right? He, was a, he was a true student of science. Um, Galileo had a refracting telescope and Annie played with refracting telescopes to make them better and be better. Um, <laughs> even though he's credited with the first one, his, his telescope really only magnified things by about 30 times as big. Um, this was really great for seeing stuff on the moon, and he's credited with the discovery of moons of Jupiter and rings of Saturn. Um, but for moons of Jupiter and rings of Saturn, he saw these things and he recorded them, um, but specifically for the rings of Saturn, this is well documented, um, he was not so sure what he was seeing. Um, and so this image down in the bottom left is a good idea of what he might have seen through his refracting telescope. It's not a great quality, and um, these are kind of things that maybe he thought they would be. Like maybe there was this elliptical body behind it, and then a planet in the middle, or he thought maybe there was this really large planet in the middle uh, with kind of two planets on either side of it. Um, he didn't realize, because his telescope was not powerful enough, 
that these were actually rings of Saturn, but he knew it was something important. Um, and and it, when he saw it, the rings were in full view, so he saw this, but as he continued to observe, uh, the rings went out of view. They kind of went into the plane of the camera, and he was unable to see them, and he actually referenced the myth of Saturn, and he says, you know, has Saturn eaten his children? Um, thinking that, that that was a possibility. What happened to these things that I just saw that I know were there? Um, Galileo and Kepler, and you might know Kepler from the Kepler spacecraft, uh, really famous, had a big discoveries a few years ago. Um, so they were kind of these astronomers who were looking out into space and discovering new things all the time. Uh, Johannes Kepler was a mathematician and he was also exploring with telescopes. And in modern times, scientists, um, their right to fame is that they publish something first. But when these guys were looking out into space, there were not really any scientific journals for them to have that claim to fame. And so what they would do is they would encode their discoveries in these anagrams, these kind of jumbled words and letters. Um, and it was a puzzle, right? And so they would encrypt, basically, or, or kind of code or turn their discoveries into these riddles and send it to the other scientists to say, hey, I found something really cool but I'm not going to tell you what it is um, because, well, it's mine, right? And um, so anyways, Galileo, after seeing the rings of Saturn, sent Kepler this anagram that you see right in the middle, um, all these jumbled up words. And Kepler thought it translated to uh, be greeted double knob children of Mars. He was off by a couple of letters and thought he had found out the big thing. Um, Kepler had his own ideas about Mars and thought it had two moons. Um, and for for something that wasn't really a good reason for thinking Mars had two moons. Um, and so he kind of interpreted this in his own bias to support what was already his idea. Um, and, and it turns out he was actually right. There are two moons of Mars, um, but not for the reason that he said, and uh, definitely not because Galileo saw them. He interpreted that anagram wrong. Uh, what Galileo actually sent is um translates to at least i have observed the highest of the planets three formed and so galileo was kind of banking on on this version of um of saturn's rings that there was this one central planet and two around it uh, as telescopes got better and better we actually found out that there were not two small planets surrounding saturn it was actually the rings right and so um with a telescope what happens is we have this incoming light and that goes back to this curved mirror and that reflects up to another mirror and the eyepiece within that. Um, also in 1590 we have the invention of the microscope and so we have these lenses that are helping us see both out into space and into um, the smaller minutia of our world that is otherwise unseen. Uh, and again we don't really have um, a specific inventor because this kind of happened when people were playing around with lenses and so again Galileo Janssen and Lippershey the same guys uh, who were credited with the telescope uh, the true father of microscopy though and and I want you guys to know this and know his name is Anton van Leeuwenhoek uh, he's a German scientist and around 1668 um, and he was first credited with actually seeing cells and he was a really interesting guy. He had, um, this was his microscope, by the way. There's this little tiny pane, and there's a lens right here that has extreme curvature to allow him to see um, cells. Leeuwenhoek was famous for looking at sperm cells, and so uh, this was really interesting. People didn't totally know um, what sex cells at all looked like or, or even how they worked necessarily, and so when he observed sperm for the first time it was a really interesting and fascinating thing um he actually later went on to hypothesize that the entire embryo was encapsulated in um in a sperm cell because of that that kind of shape at the end of it there um and that that you know it had a swimming mechanism and so on and so forth uh, and so Leeuwenhoek is credited with being kind of the father of microscopy all right, so camera obscura. We're going to go back in time a little bit now. Um, we talked about microscopes. We talked about telescopes. These are both coming out of Europe around the same time. 
Um, but way, way back, the Camera Obscura is first mentioned around uh, 470 to 390 BCE. Um, and this is an ancient invention out of China. And so this was just basically a pinhole camera. You get a light proof box, you punch a tiny hole, and you get an image on the back. And if you're really good at it, uh, you've got this light coming in through your pinhole. And oh, okay, you've also put a mirror uh, that kind of refracts that image, or I'm sorry, reflects that image up into the top of the box where you can view it. Um, Camera Obscura was actually really useful for artists, they think, and so uh, Camera Obscura can be made pretty easily and taken outside to help you paint landscapes. Uh, and so if you made a one big enough and, and angled your camera right and figured things out like that, um, these scientists, or I'm, I'm sorry, not scientists, these artists would actually sit back here and kind of uh, put paper on top of this, right, where that light was shining through would be projected on and you can kind of trace your landscape from there. Um, I'll show you guys in class. We'll make a little miniature camera obscura, but they're pretty easy to make. They're pretty fun to make and they can help you if you're not so good at drawing like me. Um, the first fixed photo though, so a camera obscura um, kind of projects an image, but it doesn't put it onto film so that you can keep it, right? It's this kind of live moving Thing that you can't really freeze frame and capture that moment or capture that image and unless you're an artist sitting there uh, trying to you know trace the lines that are being projected onto that paper. Now, the first fixed photo didn't happen until 1826 so we had camera obscura around for a long time. Um, the first fixed photo they had these metal plates that go in the back and it was this kind of liquidy thing that hardens when light strikes it and so this is great because we can use that same old camera obscura kind of setup, right? Where we just let a little light in and we've got this plate in the back and as soon as light hits it, it hardens and anything that light hasn't hit is still liquid and we can wash it away. Um, all unhardened parts get washed away. Um, it was really cumbersome though and, and kind of dangerous and a little bit flammable. Um, so not a good thing, and in 1871, shortly thereafter, the first dry plates were invented by Richard Maddox. Uh, a dry plate allowed, a, allowed this to be portable. Uh, it was not such a big fiasco. You weren't dealing with a ton of chemicals. You got better images, and overall, you had a smaller camera size. And so this led to these kind of accordion box cameras that you're probably familiar with. We've got this lens uh, that is all dark inside this little accordion. And that goes back to the dry plate and photographers would usually kind of um, drape this in a light proof cloth uh, to help with the image quality as well. The first film was made in 1885. And so if you're looking at the times on these, right, 1826, 1871, 1885, um, pictures start to get really popular and and their technology is progressing because people have a vested interest in capturing you know families and memories and things like that. Uh, in 1889 celluloid film allowed mass production of box cameras and they went wild. Lots and lots of people were able to have these. It was you know like cars in the 50s. Um, it suddenly made this very portable, very doable, and these first box cameras were called Kodaks which is a name you're still familiar with. Uh, the last thing that I want to talk about is your eye and kind of how it relates to this. And so the big things that I want you to know about your eye are um, your iris, which is the color of your eye, and that's these little muscles that kind of expand and contract. Um, I'd like you to know that your pupil is where light comes in, and that allows light to pass through your lens, which is actually behind your eye. Um, the last thing that I want you to know, and we'll talk about this later in the semester as well, um, but uh, your light, or I'm sorry, your, <laughs> your lens uh, takes light and projects this upside down, uh, this inverted real image onto your retina, which is this back wall of your eye. Um, and your retina is covered in specialized cells called rods and cones. And these rods and cones are designed to sense colors, and intensity of light. Um, depending on the wavelength of light, um, different rods and cones are stimulated 
and they're each attached to a nerve that kind of winds up going through your optic nerve and that runs to the back of your brain. Um, and so, you know, before film was invented and little did we know, um, the camera obscura is actually really a lot like an eye and instead of a retina, um, we've placed film in our cameras. And so this is just a brief history of, um, of optics. I do want you to know names and dates and kind of who did what and who's famous for what. Um, other than that, just a little appreciation about the things that we take for granted on a daily basis. Things like cell phone cameras and microscopy and um, telescopes. You know, when we talk about these things, they're, they're relatively new in the scientific world and there's a lot still to be discovered.